for us. Uh, uh, yeah, and I say thank you to this week's episode of, oh, sorry, thank you for coming to this week's episode of the Social Housing Roundtable. Um, a really, really interesting one today because I've got two people who I always try to get specialists, but these two are actually specialists. They've written papers and everything on, on this exact topic. Um, and so it's going to be, uh, please feel free to jump in at any time today and to really kind of engage with the conversation because I want this one to be lots of questions asked and I know we've talked briefly about stigma in, in other roundtables before, but today is definitely one that it is the pure focus of it. So without further ado, uh, Mercy, I'll get you to introduce yourself first and then I'll, I'll pass over to uh, Amanze. But uh, yeah, delighted to have you both with us and thank you for coming today. Mercy, you're on mute. <laughs> Still on mute. Yeah, I'm lovely. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us. I'm I'm Messi Denedo, and I'm a, and I'm a, I'm an assistant professor in accounting at Durham University. Um, so together with Amazi, who introduced himself, now we did this project. Um, um, about we started 2019. Um, to understand stigma in social housing, and last last year. Why am I missing focus? Last year, we published a report on stigma and social housing. And earlier this month, we published a follow-up report on the, on our, the finding from our consultation. So today's conversation is to discuss our findings and to get your feedback on how housing professionals, organization, board members can implement the recommendations from it. During the presentation, if anybody wants to put anything in the chat at any time, please feel free. I'll bring in questions as they come through. Um, alternatively, do use the hand raise function at the bottom of the page um, to uh, kind of jump in on the conversation at any time you like. Um, but Mercy, I'll pass over to you to start the, start the presentation because I think today we want to make sure we've got as much time as we can for the discussion bit as well. Yeah, um, is that more than that? Okay, thanks, so we split thanks. it, so you start the conversation, then I will come later. Okay. Thanks, thanks. Okay, so, um, I'm Amazi um a senior lecturer at the Newcastle University. Like Mercy said, um, sometime in 2019, uh, both of us got together and started thinking um, in a more structured way around about stigma in, in social housing. Um, I have a background in, in how in social housing. I've been on the board of um, social landlords in Scotland and, and in England. Um, and Mercy had a background more around advocacy and uh, human rights advocacy. So we started thinking about stigma in social housing. Mercy, if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, and what in, in terms of what brought us to, to this, Mercy, if you go on to the next slide, please. Yeah, in terms of what brought us to, to Mercy, this. Mercy, can you go to the next slide? Sorry, it's not moving along. Yeah. Couple of technical issues this morning. Uh, <laughs> there we are, lovely. Yeah, that one, yeah, thanks. Yeah, in terms of what brought us to this, at, at that point, um, there was an organization starting to um, set up called See the Person. Um, it's now Stop Social Housing Stigma. Um, and they were beginning to bring attention to, to stigma in social housing. And you had this, um, if the slides work, um, Mas, if you go on to the one with the tinted lenses, please. Yeah, that one, thank you. So uh, this is a picture from, from inside housing. Sorry, just trying to get this to work. Not sharing at all now. No, Matthew, yeah. we seem to have lost the, uh, lost the presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we okay. can't hear you on mute, sorry, Mercy. There we are, so yeah, the one with the sunglasses on it? Yeah. There we Thank are. Thank you. Yeah, so this was a picture from or from an inside housing um, article, an article in inside housing around that time. And what it kind of showed was the way social housing is, is viewed 
um, through tinted lenses, what would ordinarily have been a you know beautiful scene, people walking their children, taking you know their dogs for a walk, and all of that. You know, when looked through the kind of tinted lenses which society tends to view social housing um, with, it becomes a zone of criminality and you know all sorts of antisocial behavior and and stigma starts to attach. So we we start thinking, how do we you know how do we understand the stigma, where it's coming from? Um, and so we we set out to do this piece of research. The first phase of the research um, carried out in 2019. And in terms of our objectives, what we were looking at, um, we we're looking at how social housing um, stigma was constructed. So who were uh, the people involved in constructing stigma, you know, is it the politicians? Is it the um, housing, um, the landlords? Who who really is involved in constructing the stigma? How was it constructed? How do the tenants experience um, the stigma, and how is stigma being challenged? So those were kind of our priorities when we were going into the field to to do the research. In terms of what we did, we did a kind of archival analysis first, looked at documents to try and understand the history of social housing, how the kind of historical aspects. Um, we also did a series of interviews and focus groups. In total, we spoke to about 200 participants, uh, we went around the England, all the regions in, in England. And we also looked at social media to see what was going on in social media, on social media, how people were um, using social media as a platform to challenge um, stigma. So what did we find? I'll just run through these um, briefly so I will have a bit more time to, to talk. Um, pre-1970, pre you know, social housing, then it was called public housing was looked at in more positive light. So you had homes for, for the heroes returning from the from the First World War. Um, you know, after this after the Second World War, you had quite a lot of construction and people took pride in their houses. It was we had people say, you know, when their parents or grandparents got social housing, they were really happy to get it. They were proud uh, to get it. It was, you know, it was a thing of joy. There was a there was a more mix in terms of tenants. So you had doctors, you had professionals living in, in social housing uh, or what was then public housing. But post 1970 um, or, <coughs> or well, if, if, you, if you still think about that kind of pre-70 era, at a point, at least a third of the population was in social housing, but then, you know, it started to gain a reputation around well, quality of build, you know, some of the planning issues around parking and things like that. Um, you know, social spaces started to creep up and started to get a kind of reputation around it as as being cheap, subsidized by the government. So some sort of stigma started to to form. But really, post seventy was when the stigma kind of exploded. And that came from kind of government policies that are promoting home ownership. You had the rights to buy, you had the residualization of, of social housing. So increasingly the professionals were pushed out of social housing and it became housing for, for the poor, for people who, for vulnerable in society, people who couldn't afford housing. Um, and then around the kind of um, 2010, um, onwards, you had the um, the banking crisis and the recession, and then the drive with the coalition government towards um, you know welfare reforms, and a lot of that was um, built on their demonizing of of the poor. So and social housing here being um, a good part of that, following the residualization. So you, you had quite a lot of policy reform being driven by by that kind of language which stigmatized social housing. The media picked up on this and had things like benefit streets and the media, um, you know, always there to trumpet whatever 
you know, the dominant political narrative was. So media became a big focus. But we also saw the housing providers, uh, quite a lot of stigma coming from them. People told us about how their housing providers, uh, you know, tell them that they are lucky to, to have a house, you know, um, repairs are done without consideration for whether people are working or not. And we got a lot of um, talk about, you know, stigma from, from the housing providers. Um, and all of this kind of happens in, a, in, a, in the context of an increased marginalization of the tenant voice. And so there's no tenant voice at the national level, at the local levels in the housing associations and, and councils. There's less and less of tenant representation, even when they are represented. Um, they are, there's a sense that consultations are done, but nothing, they are not really listened to. It's just a tick box exercise. Complaints are not dealt with. So, so that absence of the tenant voice and power of, of the tenant enables this stigma to perpetuate. Uh, we saw a lot of inter intersectionalities with other types of stigma, drugs and crime, mental health, poverty, race, and we saw variations in terms of um, urban, rural, the north, south, um, in terms, so we saw those variations. Um, we also had a, you know, quite a lot about how people experience stigma from their from their housing providers, from the police, you know, uh, GPs, councils, people, you know, not being able to get work because of their postcodes, um, stigma in work, in schools. In London, we saw the kind of poor door phenomenon, which is like segregated housing, where um, in the same blocks you have different entrances for social housing and for leaseholders or people who bought um you know luxury apartments segregated playgrounds things like that and we saw a lot of stigma from in mixed tenure estates from homeowners and neighbors we also saw you know people trying to challenge stigma a lot of the government policy has been to challenge through planning and regeneration putting out um promoting mixed tenure estates but we saw a lot of that not not working and a lot of stigma in those mixed tenure estates. Um, in terms of the housing providers themselves, we saw some started starting to talk about tenant engagement and um, training their staff around stigma. But with that, we also saw this big disconnect between what the housing provider said was happening and what was at the tenant's perception of it. So we went into some housing providers and, you know, we spoke with their board and exec and they tell us, you know, develop this new strategy and the tenants were heavily involved in that. We took their feedback and all of that. And we walk into the next room with, with the tenants and they said, absolutely had nothing of that, didn't contribute to that, you know, don't know where this is coming from. So we saw that disconnect. And frankly, I think the larger the housing providers, the greater the disconnect we saw. Um, and then we saw organizations like what used to be see the person now stop social housing stigma, trying to put you know out counter narratives. We saw some artists trying to put up um, art exhibitions. So there was quite a bit going on in terms of trying to challenge stigma. A lot of it in silos, uncoordinated, um, and not having as much effect or you know, as it could have had if this was a more coordinated, concerted effort to, to challenge stigma. Um, what we did at the end of, of our report, which we put out on, on the phase one part of the study, was to, instead of putting our recommendations, to put out a set of questions to consultation and open that up to, to the sector. And we said, let's think about these um, questions and provide feedback and let's see um, how this can help lead towards tackling stigma. So those were the questions we put out and I'll pass it on to Mercy to talk a bit about, you know, the responses we got from, from the consultation questions. Um, thank you, Mazen, and thanks for coming up. So with the, sec um, the consultation question, we published a report earlier this month um, to highlight the feedback from the consultation. So if you've not had a look at it, you can, after the, after this um, conversation, I will upload. I will send. I will upload the link 
for you to assess it if you if you're here to assess the um, the document. So it's around seven questions, and the seven question was around um, what should what should the purpose of social housing be? Should affordable housing be seen as a right? And then um, if that's the right, we should have access to it. Um, how can we encourage politicians to limit or stop their, their use of stigmatizing language? Um, how can we encourage the media to, to produce more balanced and fairer reporting when it comes to social housing and social housing tenants? How can we create a stronger and more effective tenant voice? As Amazi said from the first report, majority of those we spoke to felt their voice are being marginalized. They don't have a platform to engage. They don't have a voice. And that is why they are being stigmatized, both at the local level within their organization, at the regional level, they don't have the platform to engage. And even at the national level, they don't have a body similar to that of the National Housing Federation that can advocate for them and that can challenge um, politicians and even the media. So they felt they need to have a stronger voice. So the fifth question was to address that, how can we create a stronger, more effective tenant voice at the local and the national level? How can we make social housing providers more accountable? That's a stiff question because majority felt, even though they are not being stigmatized at the um, governmental level, the media level, within the housing association, they are being stigmatized. The way the housing providers, housing professionals, they relate to them, they ignore them. When they, are, when they request for repairs, the way they just, ignore them. To them, it's the stigmatizing way of dealing with them and they feel they see them as the others. And because they are seen as the others, they don't really matter within their housing association. So the sixth question was to address how can we ensure that social housing providers are more accountable to their tenants. Then the sixth, the seventh question is, if we have to address all these issues, it boils down to issue of building sustainable and inclusive social housing. Then how can we build a system both at the national level and at the local level that will be more sustainable if we have to address um, stigma? So with the consultation questions, we got feedback. We had a 11 focus group conversation and this cut across board members and tenants and policy makers. We opportunity to speak to politicians, councillors, and so on. So we had 11 um, conversations around that. And some housing uh, um, association, they also organized their own focus group for us. Some of them invited us to participate in the focus group, while some they conducted the focus group on their own. So we had um, four housing associations, they converted the seven questions into surveys and they sent it to their um, tenants, their housing professionals and their partners. Their partners could be contractors, the police, board members, uh, housing professionals. So with this 149 responses, we got 103 from social housing tenants, 37 were, were from housing professionals, why nine were from there are other stakeholders, in this case, contractors, police, um, board members, and so on. And also, we got six individual um, submissions from six tenants. And we got six individual submissions from housing providers, housing associations, including the big ones and the not too medium sized housing profession, housing association. Then we got feedback from housing professionals like um, CIH. I can mention their names because they published their uh, feedback to the consultation. So you can go online and assess their, um, their submission. Uh, and National Housing Federation, National Federation of Almost, Almos they also submitted um, responses to the consultation. Then we got one feedback from one local authority personnel. So I'll quickly run through the um, feedback. So in relation to the first question, what should the purpose of social housing be? Majority believe that um, social housing should be there for everyone who cannot afford the market rent. So the purpose is to serve the need and to provide um, affordable and decent standard accommodation for all. And if we are talking about for all, as long as they choose to live in social housing, that social housing should be there to meet their needs. If they want to go into the private sector, it means it won't be there to meet their needs. But the option should be available to them. They should be able to choose whether they want to live in social housing or not. And if we're talking about the accommodation, we are talking about affordable. We are talking about high quality accommodation for all. Also, they said it should offer secure tenancy to those on low incomes, 
those seeking works or on benefit, those seen as homeless, migrants or who cannot afford the market rent. And in talking about who should have access to rates, what, what it should be, majority talked about the need to invest substantially in building more high quality social housing. They said the emphasis now is that government, their, their, their main focus is on providing homes, capitals, that um, homes for, um, so they are encouraging home ownership rather than building, investing in building more social housing. So that has resulted in people just going into the private market, even when they know that they can't really afford the rent, they can't really afford the mortgage. So because social housing is not there to meet the needs of all. Then the second one is, um, should access to affordable housing be recognized as a fundamental human right? and who should have access to it. Majority said, yes, it, we need to see in this country, particularly in England, uh, because in Scotland, the government are talking about um, housing being a right, but in England, we're yet to understand if housing is seen as a fundamental human right. So there need to be a shift in the conversation about the way housing is seen. So if housing is seen as a fundamental human right, it means everyone should have access to it, everyone should, have access to a distant accommodation. And if housing is seen as a human right, it means the government's emphasis on home ownership will need to be addressed. They need to understand that if we're looking at housing as a human right, whether they want people to own their own home, whether people want to live in social housing, they should have access, they should have the option to choose where they want to live and it's the responsibility of the government to provide that access to them, that home to them. And if we're able to address housing as a human right, then we can then begin to talk about the stigma attached to social housing and how that stigma is, is driven by the government or housing policies, introducing, encouraging people to own their own home. So, um, they, to talk about, to tackle stigma, affordability of housing should be at the core of government housing policies. They talk about the need to understand that affordability, even though when you look at the government, the white paper where government is saying they're trying to encourage people to own their own home, they're introducing the affordable home program. The concept of affordability is relative and because it's relative and subjective, what is affordable to Mr. Hay might not be affordable to Mr. B. And the emphasis is that the government should understand that there should be a wide range of housing needs and housing policy that will meet the needs of everyone. And everyone should be able to uh, afford um, housing should be provided to meet the needs of everyone. So they need to consider they have different affordability range that will enable people to own a home or live in social housing. And if we're able to talk about the issues around affordability, then we'll be able to tackle stigma in social housing. And with that, this has implication in terms of responsibility for housing providers and even the local government. They talked about under the affordable housing being seen as a right. They talked about the right to buy being a, a core cause of stigma because majority of the homes as social housing homes have been sold out without the receipt being reinvested in building more social, um, social housing. So that has led to the depletion of the stock within, that is available to those that need to live in social housing. So which is as a result of residualization, social housing is, is being residualized, is being allocated to those that are seen as vulnerable. Whereas they're not considering the fact that everyone should have a home and should be given the option to decide if they want to live in social housing or not. Majority of the feedback we got talked about the need to eradicate the right to buy in England if we have to address stigma and if we have to talk about increasing social housing stock. So around the fourth and the, the third and the fourth question is how to address and um, encourage politicians to stop using stigmatizing language and um, what that means to the media and to encourage them to produce more balanced and fairer reporting. So majority of the feedback we got from these two sections were interlinked because majority believe that the media, they take up, they pick up from what the government has said around and social housing is being seen as a springboard for something else. And the springboard for something else is home ownership. So if you are living in social housing, you are being seen automatically by the way the politician, they, they discuss social housing as a second class citizen. If you don't own your own home, then you don't have access to, you don't have the right to do things, you don't have a home, the quality of home provided is 
is just not decent enough. So majority believe that the media they pick up from what the politicians say around the housing policies, around how they portray social housing. So majority believe that if we're able to address politicians, if we're able to encourage them to stop using stigmatizing language, then the media also we need to pick up from that. So they are closely linked. The media narrative is driven by the stigmatizing political rhetoric on social housing. So when they are trying to justify their housing policies, why they need to encourage people to own their own home, majority believe that they are stigmatizing those in social housing. So they need to understand that it's not everybody that will be able to afford to own a home. And if, 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 if everyone can't really afford to own a home, they need to be more investment on, the government need to invest more in social housing. They need to build affordable homes that those that want to live in social housing will be able to afford. So, and there need to be political will and policy need to be directed towards tackling stigma. So politicians, they need to be on the ground to understand the issues faced by tenants within their uh, constituencies. And they need to understand that they are within their constituency, you have social housing tenants and their views need to be heard. They need to be understand, they need to understand how their policies, their engagement impact directly on them. Also, they talk about the need for the housing providers to also tackle the government and um, media narrative by publishing positive stories. The majority believe that most of the positive news are internally disseminated. Most of them don't leave the housing association. They don't leave the organization. If we have to tackle the external stigma, housing providers, the housing bodies, the regulators, they need to do more. They need to publicize the positive stories around social housing, around their tenant engagement in order to shape societal perception. Also with the media, they talked about the need to adopt the, the fair press for tenant, which was issued by the um, benefit to the society now, Stop Social Housing Stigma Campaign Group. It was published, I think, two years ago, highlighting our safeguards or mechanism that um, media can use to uh, portray social housing tenants in a good light rather than using their, um, rather than stigmatizing them. So, majority believe that if we're able to address politicians and the way they talk about um, the social housing, we should be able to tackle um, the media, uh, the stigma emerging from the media. So um, the fourth question is about creating a stronger and effective tenant voice. I think for those of us here, I think this might be something that will be really useful. Majority believe that if we have to address stigma internally, we need to understand that the tenant, they need to have a voice, a voice within the organization, a seat at the table within the board level. They need to have a voice. And it, when they are housing, housing providers are saying that they are listening to their tenant, they need to ensure that they listen and act on what their tenant is saying right from the beginning to the end. And when their tenants are complaining and requesting for repairs, they need to ensure that they are on top of things, address them as they emerge and not allow them to linger for too long. And within the sector, they said there needs to be a collective approach to building tenant voice. At the regional level, at the national level, they need to have an effective tenant, an effective and independent tenant body. Independent in the sense that it's not linked to any political, it's not linked to any political influence. And if we're talking about this independent body, we need to also understand that it needs to be funded. So probably future research might need to be conducted to understand how this national tenant body can be funded. And also majority talked about the need to ensure that the government to support a national tenant voice because in the past, um, different bodies, they've come together to um, introduce or establish a voice for tenant group, which the government initially, they came up, they supported them at the end of the day, they refused to support them. So if we have an independent tenant body, the government should be willing to support them. And in the decision-making process within the organization, majority believe that the tenants have to be involved right from the beginning, the conceptual phase to the, uh, to the end. They need to be involved. They need to be carried along. Their opinions should matter to the organization. So the fifth question, the sixth question is, how can we encourage housing providers to be more accountable? 
um, majority said if we have to encourage housing providers to be more accountable to tackle stigma, they need to understand the accountability has to be democratic, it has to be inclusive, and it has to be real, which means tenants have to be at the heart of any form of accountability mechanism established within the organization. There need to be a cultural shift from where both uh, tenants are seen as the external stakeholders. But within the democratic accountability mechanism, which majority talked about, tenants have to be part of the accountability mechanism that will be introduced within the organization. And in terms of that, it has to flow from the board level to the least person in the, in the organization. Majority also talked about the need to tie performance to compensation. That we have a lot of stories um, and a lot of stories being publicized on social housing and social media because performance of um, CEOs, managers, oftentimes they're not tied to their compensation. So the moment we start tying performance to compensation, the issues around disrepair will be addressed because they know that if they don't perform well, they won't be compensated. Also, majority talked about the need to have a stronger legislation that we hold housing providers accountable to their tenant. The legislation should be, shouldn't be a tick box legislation where people will just submit a form. It has to be real legislation that will hold them accountable. And if they are found wanting, they should be fine, uh, penalized. They should be uh, encouraged to pay more fine beyond what the housing ombudsman will issue. They should be penalized for that. Also, majority talked about the need to be transparent. If housing providers would like to be ac accountable to the, their tenant, they need to be transparent in the use of resources available to them in their investment plan. And when there's a need for rent increase, they need to be more transparent and inclusive. So uh, in building sustainable and inclusive social housing system, majority believe that if we're able to combine all these previous measures together, we should be able to build a sustainable and inclusive social housing system. Also, majority believe that the tenant themselves, they need to take pride in their homes and majority of the social housing tenants, they just see their home as a box. They don't take pride in their community. They just they, they engage in so many antisocial behavior that brings stigma to the estate where they live. So the moment social housing tenants, they start taking pride in their community, in their home, some of these stigma attached to social housing estate will be addressed. Also, they talk about the need to ensure that all agencies working to uh, work together to tackle stigma, including the way the police, the the, the, the police social housing estate, because in the initial report, we, we had several cases of where we had differential policing system where the way the police social housing estate is quite different from the way the police in misdemeanor estate. So majority talked about the need to ensure that there is cohesion between all the agencies and how they engage with housing providers to tackle um, stigma. Also, there need to be more investment in building high quality social housing. Majority feel that if we invest more in social housing, the government, they invest more in social housing and if our social, social homes are adequately maintained, then we'll be able to address some of the stigma. And also, the, they need to be a withdrawal of the right to buy if we have to tackle stigma. We need more stock. Okay, um, I will leave this to Amaze. Amaze, do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mercy. Yeah, Is so there, Mercy, I just want to, how long the next two slides? I want to make sure we've got time for a discussion as well. That was yeah, all. Yeah, uh, uh, next, just one or two minutes. I'm not brilliant. No worries at all. Too long. Yeah, just in terms of, um, so in, ter in terms of our reports, um, our initial reports, we got invited to speak to the inquiry which kind of just concluded on the regulation of social housing and we talked a bit about stigma and that has been picked up in the select committee's reports um we also got invited to speak to the ministry of leveling up housing whatever it's the long name is now um but um with with we we're thinking uh, at least in that presentation we talked quite a bit in terms of how we can challenge stigma through the leveling up kind of agenda. How much of that was, you know, will be carried on into policy, we're, we're not sure. But there's a sense that we now have a kind of window of opportunity to give voice to 
tenant issues to um, more actively challenge stigma. Mercy, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, and some of the things which, you know, out of the report we are kind of thinking about and which in a sense needs to be addressed as we think more constructively about stigma is we can see those variations in, in terms of regional variations, in terms of generational variations and, and all, all of that. And it points to stigma being, yes, there's this kind of societal stigma, but we need much more localized understandings of stigma to be able to tackle that. Um, we need to be able to understand how intense it is in some places and not. But more importantly, we need to think about how we can develop this tenant voice, this um, would it be a national body? Would it be more localized? What would it look like? Or what would give tenants an effective say in the um, in social housing? I mean, we we'll talk about co-regulation in social housing, but co-regulation between you know the regulator and the housing providers. Why is the tenant absent from that co-regulatory arrangement, and how can we put the tenant into that? arrangement. Also, a lot of uh, stigma revolves around the lack of investment and investment in social infrastructure in these estates. Um, and so how can we drive that kind of investment in social infrastructure and in investment in social housing more broadly? So I think, you know, those are kind of conversations which we would like to see happen. Um, We'll just throw it open to kind of discussion from here. And thank you so so much. Like uh, absolutely brilliant in terms of the research and everything you've gone into um, that, that's gone into there. And I particularly this idea of localized uh, localized stigma being so powerful. And I think that's something that sometimes gets overlooked when we look at the kind of wider social housing picture people go well, we need to fix it and people don't know how and i think it's because they, they don't look local they look more global those who've been um on the chat the chat has been going mad throughout that so thank you very uh mercy and, and, and amanze because lots of people really really engaged I, I, just looking there in terms of the last couple of points um sophia put that she thinks the media likes to direct focus on the threats people should be worried about um, that are always, almost always in the most vulnerable demographics and then almost to encourage people to judge whether people are deserving or not of support and that this is really strongly demonstrated in social housing stigma and, and Pamela has mentioned think social landlords should hire more social housing tenants to engage with some change from within as long as they listen to lived experience. Mercy has shared the report there and I'll make sure that goes round as well afterwards and email that round to everybody. You've got a copy of that but is a manze or marseille or anybody else who wants to who wants to kind of get involved was there a change uh when you found you know were any of the any of the, the places you interviewed did they have any tenants on the board or did they have any tenants involved in those kind of things did that create a, a different narrative well um again it's it's variable and here's the thing um the tenant on the board might not be the solution to to the problem um it might be one way, but I think there are many ways to, to solve the problem. I've seen, so in going around, we've seen boards where the tenants have had a strong voice. And we've, uh, I'll give you an example of another board which we went to, the tenant was the chair of the board. But what he told us was, look, when I came on the board, the first thing I was told was, you need to remember that you are no longer a tenant. You are now, you know, one of us, as the board and your role is to look at the um, bigger picture, look at the good of the organization as opposed to the tenant's perspective. How um, mad. Why would you have the tenant on the board if you're going to ignore the fact that they were a tenant? Mercy. Yeah, uh, probably because they, they just bring in them. I mean, this conversation, like you said, like, has been going on for a while and people have they recognize that tenant needs to be part of the uh, management system. So from the conversation we had, even with the first report was that they like, we went to all, we went to um, Birmingham where we had tenants 
being board member. And they felt even though we have the opportunity to come in and share our lived experience, which they felt will have been a good thing and that will have shaped the organizational system, the way they do things, the way they engage with practitioners and the way they engage with tenants. They felt as if they brought them in just to tick a box and even when they are speaking, they are being silent. They don't really have a voice. So it's a, it's a different thing being a board member. It's a different thing having a voice. So they, they are board members, but they, they, don't, they don't really have the voice to influence the change that they hope for. It, it's, it, it's madness to me, but, you know, that's, that's easy, I suppose, from sitting on the outside in. Is anybody who was involved today or anybody who's kind of been listening would like to kind of come in with any questions of on, on what they've heard today or any points they would like to make? Yes, please, Tom. Yeah, I've just got one thing, just going back a little bit to what Amanzi said. He said, you know, pre-1970, we had 34% of UK households in social housing. Then later on, you said that we're down to 70%. It's literally halved. Now, there's got to be more accounts of that than just saying buy to let and social landlords. What is causing that huge squeeze where it's gone, literally being cut in half to what it was, you know, 50 years ago. I think there has been a concerted policy kind of push in government to reduce the amount of social housing um, through the rights to buy, through large scale voluntary transfers and all of that. But what has happened is that there's no so the government talks a lot about investing in housing and all of that, but a lot of the investment is not investing in social tenure. So there's investment in kind of affordable housing, which is like shared ownership, which are sold off. And so those are not social housing. Um, and so most of the investment has gone in that. The actual investment in social housing um, is, is close to nothing. Mm. There's also a point that Joe Lucky has yeah. made actually in the chat, cuts in government funding for rented housing have been key. Yeah. And also, I think for a lot of social housing providers these days, the only way they're keeping afloat is with some of the stock that they're building. They're building it yeah. for private rent or for private sale, yeah. because that's the only way they're able to survive. So we're just running out of room and everything has been built. Plus, and I don't know whether or not this is right, Amanda, I'd imagine that the amount of private landlords in those times have gone up considerably because a lot of people now are private landlords and rent for profit. Yeah. 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 Yes, uh, Aziza, apologies if I pronounced your name wrong there. Perfect. Hi, Matt. Hi, Mandy. Hi, Matt Hi. Mersky. Thank Hi. you for the presentation. I'm not an expert of the UK context. I'm, I'm, I'm more invested in um, French context. And what I understood is that mostly being the owner is something valued and, and encouraged. Well, from the French perspective, you have to know that in France, the most stigmatized um, areas are the, the, the neighborhood where social tenants become became owners. Mm. And in France, the tendency is the opposite. This, I mean, basically a social landlord will sell, we don't have houses, we have mostly uh, apartment flats in France in, uh, in the social housing um, uh, stock. So mostly they sell the, 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 the flat to the, 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 the tenant, then the tenant become owner, then there's a lot of charges, they cannot, you know, handle the charges. So the elevator is not working, there's no maintenance, and it's be becoming more and more, you know, economically fragile, and th then the very poor stays, and then the people that can go. So basically the idea in France is if you have a um, formerly social housing uh, estate that is now owned by people, it's more stigmatized that if it's currently owned by the social landlord. Mm. Almost going through the right to buy has actually been more negative for it than, than holding it by the, the housing association in the first place. Well, what is interesting here, um, so we have those kind of estates where you've got quite a lot of people who bought up their own homes. So there used to be social housing. They've been bought up. You end up with an estate which has some social housing and some people who bought up their own housing. Um, now, what we started to see was a dynamic where 
people who had bought up their own housing then feel that they've moved up in terms of social status and stigmatize those who still in the housing. Yeah. Yes. Um, we also saw the kind of thing which you've seen where um, because they bought up theirs and they are not able to maintain to the same standards the social housing uh, landlords would usually maintain, their houses have tended to fall into disrepair. But the stigma still gets put on the social housing as opposed to people who bought theirs. Um, so you go into an estate and um, you know what people see is it is houses in disrepair and the immediate assumption is that those are the social housing ones irrespective of whether they are or they aren't um, but part of it is also borne out by the new builds which we see so you, you have the new build estates which you know you are meant to be mixed tenure a mixture of social housing and and private housing you know, most of the social housing through section 106 um, but those social housing are built to a different standard in, in a sense. And so you, you walk into the estate, you can immediately see which are social housing and which are not. I walked into an estate um, and the salesperson in the estate told me, look, um, all the houses with tarmac driveways are social housing and all the housings with brick paved driveways are private housing. So it's not just for a cost saving because that's what the the, uh, the RP can afford. Yeah. So immediately I can tell which are social housing and which are not. And once I can do that, I can stigmatize. Of course. Yeah. yeah anyone living there? Tom, I'm going to come to you in a moment. There's a few points in the in the chat. Um, Pamela, to be honest, the tenants that volunteer for boards aren't always representative, especially if you only have one. Tenants are very diverse groups. Couldn't agree with you more there. You trying to get their voice. Collective voice is very difficult, and I know we've had, you know, we had we had one with a tenant on here a couple of weeks ago, and you know, often it's the people who are the loudest that, that tend to get onto the boards or tend to get those voices. But is that representative of your whole community? Is really difficult. She then said some housing stock ended up being demolished due to disrepair, and then when rebuilt, only a percentage was social. It would, it's the way that it is funded as well. Councils get a subsidy, but exempt accommodation is ring fenced by housing benefit. So it's cheaper for councils to give the stock to an Alma or housing association. Yeah. Uh, Pamela, do we think the stigma is different for shared ownership? I have an interesting one which I'll bring on in, in a moment. Um, feel like it isn't impacted by stigma in the same way. I know friends who've, who've gone through shared ownership and certainly I don't know anyone who gave them or, or stigmatised them for that. And yet, if they'd heard they were in social housing, they might have done. That's a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, I've still seen by owner occupiers. Oh, it's gone the other way. It's still seen by owner occupiers as social housing. Um, and actually, her daughter was discriminated against by the owner occupiers of the estate. So clearly, there's there's some discrepancy there. Um, and poor laws, access to play, etc. Evidence of stigma. Amanze or Mercy, did you find any with shared ownership anything that came up on the stigmatized side? Yeah. Um... Do, should I go first? Well, yeah, I think for, I remember there was um, a focus group that we had in London, um, one of the big housing association, where we had um, participants who are share owners, and we have um, owner occupiers, and then we have um, we have social housing tenants, and you could feel the tension in the room where we're talking about the stigma because social housing tenants felt they are being stigmatized by even the share owners and the service, they were talking about service charge, lack of access to facilities and so on, and how they feel as if they were not being given access. And even with that, the shared owners then within the, within the focus group also felt stigmatized because most times the way they tackle issues around share ownership, the service that they felt most time is actually eating. Majority of them are not aware of how much they're expected to pay in service charge. So they felt because of that, they are being stigmatized. So you have different types of stigma going on. The social center and feeling as if no one is listening to them. They don't have access to facilities. The share owners feel they have access to facility, but they are required to pay more because as a result of their shared ownership. Whereas the owner occupier, they feel because they have, uh, this, they, they pay more, they pay more 
reach that. So their issues need to be addressed. They need to come first regardless of who and who is attending to who. So you have these different types of stigma going on within the housing association. And I think um, I can remember one of the conversation we had with one of the professionals where she was talking about the need to ensure that we have a standardized service provided to all regardless of their tenure that will help ensure that all of them, they are seen as the same and not that because they are social housing tenant, because of that, we need to provide substandard service to them. And because they are shared owners, we need to provide a marginalized or a middle rate service to them. We need to ensure that the services are at the same at par. Yeah. yeah, I think there are two things there. One is the stigma coming from the housing association towards the tenants, shared owners, and and the stigma within um, the you know the different groups of people. Um, there's some sort of hierarchy. So um, the the owner the owners uh, owner occupiers see themselves as superior to the shared owners, and so would stigmatize shared owners and social housing tenants. The shared owners see themselves as you know, superior to the social housing tenants, and so would stigmatize social housing tenants. And we saw that in kind of our field work quite, quite a lot, um, you know, and it comes down to little things. Okay, you have a, you, you know, you have the residents association who, you know, how do you constitute the membership of that? Um, you know, residents association wants to, you know, say, have a barbecue. Um, you know, some people can't afford it. Generally, it tends to be those in social housing who can't afford it. They tend to you start to look at them as the problem people on the estates. You know, um, with with the housing providers, they would provide. So we had a housing association who had a dedicated line for people who on shared ownership, and so they you know, there are complaints coming through that dedicated line and they handle it with, with speed. The social, you know, tenants, you know, it gets kind of shoved to the side, you know, why does that happen? Yeah, yeah. I guess they feel, yeah, there's a more of a burden, even though obviously that's what you're paying for, regardless of how you're paying for it, you're paying for a service. Yeah. So the question should come through. Joe has mentioned in the chat there that whilst we remain a consumer society that measures success on monetary gain and possessions, there will be stigma against those who can't afford to own property. And I, and I couldn't agree more. Um, certainly couldn't couldn't agree more. And I mean, I rent myself, I, I, I private yes. rent, but certainly there's a, there've been moments going, well, why haven't you just bought your house yet? Well, because I can't afford to. <laughs> it's almost like there's a judgment or you're doing something wrong. So for those in social housing, it's, it's going to be worse, even though, you know, we did a, uh, a, a, a piece a few weeks ago uh, on these round tables and it's only about 10 or 11 percent of people in social housing who don't work you know everyone works they're the professionals everywhere there's some amazing skill sets and yet there's still the stigma of somehow people being stupid or poor or criminals or whatever it'll be that go with it that 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 sticks with this sticks with this narrative and it's that that needs to change um i know it's something we've discussed on a number of these rounds. michelle yes please do come in Hi, really interesting conversation. Thank you, Mercy and Monze. It makes me wonder how many people who actually work in the sector have actually lived in social housing and, you know, whether it's that lived experience, um, because unless you've experienced something, you can't actually fully appreciate what it's like. And when you mentioned about, I mean, my, one of my first roles was right to buy and it was always the the three bedroom houses that went. And then you've got section 106s where there's housing associations competing to get those that, that stock and they're becoming more commercial enterprises. And when you look at right to buy receipts, it doesn't go back, especially if it's an LSVT, it doesn't go back to the housing association to build more stock. It actually goes back to the local authority and there's a very small percentage that they keep. And it makes me think, you know, should housing associations be more doing more to incentivize people that are under occupying to release that family home, especially when it's becoming more and more costly to actually 
build the family homes and what can we do to get them in as I say I prefer to call it right sizing and you you just basically you, you know sometimes we don't need to be rattling around in a three or four bedroom house when all the family have left so how can we help those to to shift that but yeah it's uh it is really complex, but it's really interesting to see you guys put this uh, this data together. So thank you for doing that. No, thank you, Michelle. And really, really, really strong, powerful point there, I feel. And, uh, you know, it, it, or slightly different. Sophie Phillips there has, has put into the chat. I think a lot of people who secured mortgages a long time ago are completely ignorant of the, complete, the current situation. They assume the situation is still the same as when they did it. And if they did it, other people should be able to. And that's back by um Pamela's point I'm just going to bring in now actually as buying will get harder as time goes by will these stigmas change by themselves or will the gap be more between private and social rather than owners v renters and I feel we're seeing this anyway politically massively at the moment with the divide between it's less conservative v Labour and more conservative versus anybody else and it seems to be that divide that, that's really interesting Pamela let me bring you in no it's just um so I'm going to put my video on, but I am wearing a hoodie. <laughs> um, no, it was just about... Well, call it's cold today. I think everyone is chilly, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just about under occupancy because um, I think that is kind of a social divide as well. During COVID, when everybody had to work from home, who's got an office? You know what I mean? And like thinking you might have a spare bedroom, but is there a size appropriate property that you could actually move into? And or is that, does that give you the ability to work from home? And I think part of so many more people working from home, that's kind of an, another divide that we need to keep an eye on because you might have workers, two people working for a housing association, one in a purpose-built office next to a conservatory and one kind of in the corner of their bedroom upstairs. So I do think, you know, as time goes on, rather than it being under occupancy, it might be people maybe have a right to have a space at home to be able to work from home. And if not, that's another potential socioeconomic divide. So it's a bit and off topic. And it's, and it's, no, no, no. But it's, it's again, it, it's exactly that. Because then we're saying, well, if you're a social housing tenant, you're not allowed a, a home office because that is a bedroom. And so I like, completely agree with you. And actually, Joe's put in the chat there, over time, won't social housing become more desirable again? Because private renting is insecure. I think on the flip side of it, Joe, you know, there, there are more and more I guess, protective laws coming in for private tenants. And I don't know if there's the same for the social housing. Kate Wood, let me bring you in. Hi, sorry, I'm working from home today. So you can either have video or audio because I live in the middle <laughs> of nowhere. Okay. So I'm not being rude. Um, I'm really interested in this because I, I work in the exempt accommodation uh, sector. I work in temporary accommodation, currently on behalf of um, a large Northwest Council. Um, and it's really interesting to me because um, I deal with roughly 20 housing associations. Um, and we have, and, and as you've just said, Matt, a lot of my tenants actually work. So actually, you know, they are uh, they are looking for something at a social rent so they can afford somewhere because they deal with families. Um, but as somebody's just said, you know, what about working from home? And with the rise in staircasing, how does that work with with um, under occupancy? Because actually, if somebody's got shared uh, occupancy and they own thirty percent of their home, but all of a sudden their children leave home, how are you going to say to them? But you mind just moving down to a smaller property? You know, you don't have the right then because you've got that you've got that divide. And um, I also just wanted to pick up the thing about um, the tenants' voice on the board, and and I've seen this so many times. I've worked with lots of councils between Newcastle and Leicester, basically. Um, and what tends to happen with the tenants' voice is they tend to pick the ones that don't give them any nonsense. And yet, NatFed Fed guidelines actually state that we should be um, utilising um, sort of that diversity and representing the co cohort that um, is the, the, the socio-economic cohort that we represent so actually we should be looking for people that are not just tenants that have got disabilities BAME but also those are the professionals that work and do all that sort of stuff as well so I mean unfortunately you know I think it's a 20-year issue and we're going to have five changes of government in that time so um, <laughs> if anybody can come up with a solution to that that would be fab but um, yeah I just wanted to pick those up and thank you for the report because um I've, uh, I've, I've earmarked that to send that to my management team. Yeah, I, it was that that Mercy and I first, yeah, you know, she mentioned she was putting this report together with, with Amanze and, and the teams. And it was it was so important. I thought we brought this to brought this to discussion today. And I feel this, this topic is absolutely so and flow. Um, 
I'm aware that people have got 12 o'clock they need to get to because I think a couple of people are already diving off and things on those lines. But Mercy or Manze, Mercy, I'll come to you first. Are there any kind of final points you'd like to make on this or, or what is for you, I guess, the key takeaway that people need or housing associations and local authorities need to be doing now to start, start making the change that we need? Yeah, thank you. I, I think let's let's go back to the tenant voice and the issues around diversity. And because the majority of those we spoke to felt is a big issue that the house the housing providers need to address. And we understand that we are within the board membership, we have limited space for tenants. So we most times you can't really afford to take more than two people. Then the question is how can we ensure that even if we just need two people at the board level? How can we ensure that still the board and the housing providers they engage with their tenant? Then the question is how effective is the tenant forum within the housing association? The housing providers are they use, really using their um, tenant forum to engage with their tenant? Because if you have tenant forum and the tenant forum is not effective, then you won't be able to get as many views into your decision making as you should have been. So probably if they can't get people into the board membership. The other option is to ensure that they have a very strong, effective tenant forum, tenant representing, tenant association. And the CEOs, the board members, they should be there when they're having this meeting to understand what the tenants want, how they want it, and when they want it. If they can't get them to participate at the board level, that could help address the stigma. And also around the issue of um, tackling the external stigma, because we've talked about the internal stigma, what the professionals they need to do. And so, but around the external stigma, I think housing association, they need to start understanding that they can shape the conversation externally as well by publishing all the positive stories going on within the housing association, by ensuring that their tenants are being listened to. And I mean, we, we have someone like uh, Kojo, if if Kojo, I mean, all the activism around social housing won't exist if the housing association they are doing what they are expected to do. So why not address, encourage housing associations to address their tenant complaints and their tenant requests as that when they they put in those requests rather than allow them to linger because it means if they are able to address those complaints on time, it means they have the opportunity to listen and to act. And we won't have all these negative stories around um, disrepairs, around tenants being ignored. And in order to tackle that, if the housing providers are doing the right thing, they should publicize it. They should shape the conversation on social media, publish it, don't just leave it within the housing association, take it outside the housing association so that people will be aware that, oh, this organization, they are doing um, something fantastic. Also the housing profession like CIH, the National Housing Federation, they also have a role to play in tackling stigma. They also need to engage with the housing association, engage with policymakers to shape that narrative around stigma. I think there's a huge, huge point there, and actually it ties in quite nicely with the point that was made in the chat just before, which is around unconscious bias and and uh, you know and the stigmas that go with kind of the innate stigma in staff teams, and they also need addressing. And I couldn't agree with you more, Mercy. Amanze, I'll pass over to you for final thoughts. I, I think uh, for me, um, a lot of what is being done to tackle stigma is, um, in a sense, fighting the symptoms without. Um, tackling the underlying root causes. And for me, that's where the more important discussion needs to be had. At its root, um, within, if you look at the internal, external kind of split, internal within the sector, the issue here is the position of the tenant. How powerful is the tenant? You have, we, are, we all know there's a the power imbalance. How do you correct that power imbalance? How do we make housing associations more? accountable to their tenants? How do we give the tenants a stronger voice within housing associations and uh, housing providers? Um, how do we give them a stronger voice in the in the regulatory arrangements in, in the sector? Um, you know, the kind of external stigma, the, the, the more uh, societal side of things is, uh, fundamentally around government policy. How do we shift government policy? And until we can shift government policy to value renting as um, 
or see renting as a, a, a valuable, valuable part of the kind of tenure mix um, and start to drive policy in, in, in that direction. We will continue to stigmatize renting. Um, and so for me, those are the two kind of key areas we need to be to be tackling is i mean yes we can try to influence government policy as much as we can but i think as practitioners in the sector it's easier to start to to think about the things we can influence more more directly which is around accountability mechanisms around tenant participation tenant engagement how do we empower the tenants and do it um you know not in a tick box kind of way I mean, we've talked about unconscious bias, you know, the kind of paternalistic attitudes which, which are dominant in, in the sector. So how do we challenge those? I think for me, those are the kind of key areas I want to see work being done, done in. Brilliant. I thank you both, uh, Mercy and Mande, and everyone who could join today. Really interesting, and I think this will be a conversation that we've we've touched on in different areas before but certainly some new things were brought to the table today um and it's clear that change is to be made but as you say so much of it is around training and people understanding actually where the bias is and where the where the stigma lies um and i don't know just from internally in housing associations which definitely is fact but also in the media um but i'd love to see the cih and the national housing federation be more vocal and be, take more account um for the issues going on in the sector and, and and be that voice for for future change um and that's it for today uh and just where we, we've run a little bit over so thank you everybody who could stay that bit longer next tuesday um we've got a round table actually focused on it's more in the anti-social behavior space um and we're going to be discussing cannabis and how difficult that is to actually regulate how difficult it is to do anything about um, and how difficult it is to enforce and what we can do collectively as a sector to try and make change there. So hopefully see a number of you there. But until then, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Mercy and Amanda, for all of the information. And I'll share the uh, the report round. Um, and obviously, please feel free to get in touch with both of them regarding any future questions. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.